Okay, so we're going to carry on now with our uh, fundamental doctrines of the Bible. And uh, just to bring us up to date, we did uh, grace, which is um, God's undeserved favour. Remember we talked about uh, how through God's grace we see the free gift of salvation. Um, we looked at uh, repentance, the turning away both outwardly and inwardly from sin. Uh, we talked about faith, the means which God uses to bring about uh, and to, to receive that gift, that free gift. And we talked about justification. Remember what happens in the tribunal of God uh, when you exercise your faith. And now we're going to look at regeneration and sanctification. I'm going to start off uh, straight away by turning to the book of Titus. And it's uh, Titus. Chapter 3, chapter 3, just after uh, Second Timothy, and uh, starting in verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Saviour toward man appears, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So that's where we get this word, regeneration. And so he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And um, I, I don't know if it was this exact verse, that we heard when we, we went to the baptism uh, the other week at uh, Grace Baptist. But this certainly is, is, is an allusion, I think, to the baptism. And uh, as, the, as the chap there was saying, that uh, it's symbolized by baptism, uh, regeneration and sanctification. Death and burial of your old self, but also a sign that you've been washed and cleansed from your sin. And so that's really what regeneration is talking about, is that you have this new life, that, that God somehow uh, implants in you this uh, new life, and he regenerates you, he, he brings you to life. And uh, probably one of the most famous verses uh, that discusses this is in John 3 and verse 3, and we'll look at that, Gospel of John. John 3. And verse 3. And uh, yeah, we'll start there. Jesus answered and said unto him, the him of course being Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, remember talking about baptism again, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So we can see from this, uh, these few verses that there are two, if you like, orders of life that are open to people. One is called the flesh, that is, you know, natural, and one is called spiritual. So the first order comes with the gift of life itself. When you are born as a baby, you've entered into that first uh, uh, order of life, the natural. You've been born of flesh. You, know, you are yourself are flesh, and you've been born from somebody else's flesh. But the second is the result of a decision. The second, the second birth, is a spiritual birth. It's something that's to do with the spiritual realm. And that's what it really means to be a Christian, although it, being a Christian involves things like what you believe, um, uh, what you know doctrinally, what you understand, having right doctrine, uh, living a moral life, doing good works, and all those things, that in itself doesn't make you a Christian. You have to be born of the Spirit, you have to be regenerated by God. And uh, you know, what we're doing when, when we've been looking at all these different doctrines is 
we're looking at somebody becoming a Christian. And uh, if you like, if, if you can imagine somebody being filmed becoming a Christian, what we're doing is slowing the film down until you're going to slow the film right down and you see it frame by frame by frame. That's what we're doing. We slow it right down and we say, okay, this is, this is the grace of God and understand the grace of God. Now we're seeing them uh, uh, repenting of the sins. Now we're seeing them exercising faith. Now they're being justified and now we're seeing regeneration and sanctification. And uh, uh, Burkhoff's summary of Christian doctrine says that ge regeneration is that act of God by which the principle of the new life is implanted in man and the governing disposition of the soul is made holy. So that's what, that's what we're talking about here. And it's the Greek word, because of course, we said before, the New Testament was written in Greek, and it's a bit of a mouthful, this, but for, for regeneration, it's palingenesia. Palingenesia. And it's a word that literally means rebirth. And so if you, if you go and talk to uh, a Jehovah's Witness or someone like that uh, about being a Christian, you say, well, you need to be born again. They'll deny that. They'll say, oh, no, you don't, you don't need to be born again. But we're going to see as we come through these verses and we, and we go and look at the scripture that it's absolutely essential that you're born again. That, that you can't be a Christian, you can't have what God has to offer unless you have that rebirth. So, seems like a fair question. Let's ask it, why do we need to be reborn? Why is it so important? Why can't you just believe in God and, and just follow the teachings of Jesus? Why do we need to be reborn? It all revolves around the question of sin and what sin has done to you as a person and, and about sin coming into the world. That's why we need to be reborn. And we've got to go right back to the beginning of the Bible, back to Genesis chapter 1 to find out why we need to be born again. Okay, so Genesis 1, verse 26. Genesis 1, 26. Okay, 1, 26, and we have it. And God said, let us, I mean this is again another one for the Jehovah's Witnesses, who is the us, the Trinity, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Okay, so originally man was made in uh, after God's image and in his likeness. And uh, verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created him male and female created he them. And, you know, what is that image? What is the image of God? Well, we're reading Ephesians 4, 24, that that image is righteousness and true holiness. So, so that's the image of God. Um, when we're born into the image of God, originally, you know, like in Adam and Eve, it was righteousness and true holiness. Now, what do we learn about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? When sin came in, they lost that. You look at the people, the unrighteous people, the wicked people in the world who live without God, who have no knowledge of Jesus Christ, are they living in righteousness and true holiness? No. Therefore, they've lost the image of God. Are they walking in the likeness of God? No, they're not like God at all. In fact, they're very much like somebody else. You know, no wonder the Bible, uh, Jesus says to the Pharisees, you're like your father, the devil. Yeah, so the more now man is more in the image of the devil than he is in the image of God because he's a liar, he's a fornicator, he's a drunkard, he's full of pride and wickedness and sin. Now, that needs to be dealt with in some way. So he's not like the image of God. So in Genesis 2, uh, verse 16. You know, how did this happen? Verse 16, And the Lord God commanded a man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Verse 17 of uh, Genesis 2. You will surely die. Now, when he sinned, did he drop down there? No, he didn't, did he? He didn't die suddenly. But God said, in the day that you eat, you'll die. 
But something else died in him. The image of God died. His spirituality died. He became dead in trespasses and sins. And so this is, is the death that God was speaking of. And so there is now a need for him to be, if you like, recreated in the image of God. He must now be recreated. Man, sinful man, must be recreated in the image of God. He must be reborn. He must be regenerated. And that's what we're looking at now. That, that doctrine of regeneration means you have to be regenerated, recreated. The Bible says that when you become a Christian, you are a new creation. And that's what it's talking about. You know, that restoration of spiritual life and you where you can now communicate with God. You can walk in righteousness and true holiness. And the, the new birth is an experience. Now, I heard people say, becoming a Christian, excuse me, let's take a drink. Becoming a Christian is not an experience. That being born again doesn't have to be an experience. And I think uh, the reason they say that is because they're thinking of a charismatic kind of uh, uh, you know, wild experience of, of falling over and speaking in tongues and that kind of thing. But, but they're really taking liberties with the word experience. The word experience, according to the dictionary, is a direct personal participation or actual contact. An event. Something that happens. Becoming a Christian, being regenerated, has to be something that happens to you. It's not just, you know, having a system of beliefs or, or, or even if it's feeling very strongly about things or, or amending your life very carefully, that's not the same as God doing something in you. That's what regeneration is. God does something in you that you couldn't do in yourself. It's an experience. It's an event. An experience is when something happens to you. If, if nothing has happened to you, then yes, you could say it's not an experience. But then, therefore, surely, it means nothing has happened in your life. You haven't become a Christian. Now, Jonathan Edwards said, Conversion must be discerned rightly by ministers of the gospel, inquiring into the religious affections. Now, I wonder how many uh, ministers of the gospel do inquire into the religious affections of their congregation. Though it may be falsely appraised, true conversion bears distinguishing marks, he said. It bears distinguishing marks. And I would uh, put it to you that one of those marks is sanctification. We're looking tonight at regeneration and sanctification. Now, sanctification, to be sanctified, means to be washed clean and set aside for holy use. And again, we're referring back to the baptism uh, that Kirsty and I went to and watched the other day, where, where the girl went down in the water, and then they, they kind of pulled her back up again, and it's symbolically... Uh, a cleansing, a washing away of her sin. Not that the, the baptism itself does it, but that's what it symbolizes. That's saying this is what happened to her. That's partially what uh, baptism is symbolizing. And uh, uh, it is the separation of the soul from sin and the devotion of the whole being to the will and service of God, as William Booth puts it. Okay, so this is all throughout the Bible you read this. Psalm 4, verse 3. For know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. And if we turn to Ezekiel 36, these are absolutely brilliant uh, passages. Ezekiel 36. And verse 25. Okay. So Ezekiel 36, verse 25, uh, God of course speaking, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart 
of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Isn't that brilliant? It's just a description of all that we've been talking about, being sanctified, being regenerated, having the Spirit of God put in you, and causing you to walk in its statutes, causing you to walk uh, in, in His laws and His commandments, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. You know, that, that's as much a promise as it is a commandment. And then we see in verse 29 of that same chapter, I will also save you from all your uncleanness. This is regeneration and sanctification. This is where God does something in you that you couldn't do for yourself. As we said, it's symbolized by baptism. The burial of that which is dead. Let's look at that as well. So if we turn to Romans 6, to the New Testament, Romans 6 and verse 4. So we're looking really at the two aspects of baptism here as well. You know, the, the fact that it's symbolic of that cleansing, but also that the baptism is symbolic of a burial that takes place. Okay, 6 verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So there's a burial of that which is dead, the burial of your old self, your old life, and then you, you walk after that in the newness of life. And then if we turn to verse 6, again in the same chapter, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified, that is, killed, just as Jesus was. Our old man is crucified with him, the him of course being Jesus, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Let's just repeat that again, because everybody say it with me. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Yeah. You know, and the reason I said say that with me is because you would wonder from listening to some people teach whether the Bible actually did say that, but it does. You are free from sin. When you are dead, you're free from sin. And this is saying, you know, reckon yourself to be dead with him. Your old self, your old man is crucified with Christ. And that's why Paul can say, I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me, Galatians 2.20. And uh, I was amazed because I, I read this the other day um, about what Calvinists believe about regeneration. And I read this in a Calvinist textbook. So I'm not, you know, trying to, uh, I'm not picking up some kind of internet propaganda or anything like that. This is a Calvinist textbook. And I never knew that they believed it. But uh, this, this chap who wrote the book was saying, that regeneration to a Calvinist takes place before they exercise any faith. That, that they believe that regeneration takes place first and then you exercise faith in God. And I, I just thought, that's crazy. You know, but that, that's what they believe because they say, well, uh, uh, a, a dead person can't exercise faith. But, I mean, you could also say, well, if you take it to that extreme, a dead person can't commit sin. But, but that is part of their belief in, in total depravity, or, which is really, uh, as far as I concerned, total inability. But uh, uh, we don't believe that, you know, I think the Bible clearly shows that, that regeneration is something that takes place, something that God does as a response to you exercising faith. You know, that is the gift, that is the free gift that comes, is that regeneration uh, uh, and, and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is the one who makes you holy. You know, that, that sanctific, sanctifying power that's within a Christian that makes them holy. And, uh, uh, you know, we could go on to talk about uh, partial and entire sanctification, 
uh, but we'll leave that for another time. Well, that really is what I wanted to say uh, to you today is the idea of regeneration and sanctification. Regeneration where, you know, you are reborn. And the reason we must be reborn is because we lost that image of God, that likeness of God that, that, that Adam first had because of sin coming into the world. We lost it. And uh, in God, through rebirth, through regeneration, and sanctification it is restored and we can now walk in righteousness and true holiness no longer walking in sin in fact as we read in Romans uh, he that is dead is free from sin buried in that, that, that uh, uh, thing that is symbolized by baptism buried and dead and then risen again in newness of life to walk in newness of life in regeneration and in uh, sanctification